I think it's a good idea for knitters and crocheters, anybody, weavers, anybody who uses yarn to kind of have a, at least a basic understanding of how yarn's made and where it comes from. So I thought I'd do a little demonstration on how we spin yarn. So this is a sample of a fleece from a sheep. Now this has been washed, so when it comes off the sheep it's, it's very dirty. It has a lot of lanolin in it, which is actually really good for your hands. It's used in a lot of like lotions and whatnot. Um, but you, you need to wash it. Well, some people spin it raw, but most people wash it before they spin it. So this has been washed. And then, so even though we specialize in cashmere goats, I'm going to demonstrate with wool because it's easier okay. uh, to spin and to demonstrate with. So I can talk and do that at the same Perfect. time. <laughs> and the only difference is between processing wool and cashmere on a high level basis is that the wool you, you wash them both then the cashmere you have to dehair because cashmere is the undercoat of a goat so this is a sample of raw cashmere this has not been washed Um, and you can see there's some long, straight, thick fibers in there, and then there's a lot of this really, really fine, kind of downy stuff. That really fine stuff is the cashmere. These thicker guard hair fibers have to be separated out before it's spun into yarn, otherwise the yarn would be very itchy. Okay, so that's a dehairing process, and they do that before carding. So they'll do the washing, the dehairing, then the carding. For cashmere, alpaca, llama, and some other uh, muskox, other fibers that need to be dehaired. Wool does not typically need to be dehaired, so that step is skipped for the wool. But everything cashmere else is so pretty. Expensive. That's one of the reasons why. <laughs> yeah, one of the reasons why that, and like I said earlier, cashmere good only produces three to five ounces per year. So, um, so, so I'm going to demonstrate in wool. So we washed it already, um, and then if it were cashmere, the next step would be dehairing, but this is wool, so we're going to skip the dehairing and we're going to go straight to the carding. And of course, factories nowadays have big machines that do this, but if it's put done by hand like this for hundreds, I don't know, maybe even thousands of years. So we take some of the washed wool and we put it on a carder, which is looks pretty much like a giant dog brush, and we've got two of them. And then we use them in opposite directions to tease the wool. So what we're doing is, well I shouldn't say tease it, because teasing implies we're tangling it, but it, um, it combs out the wool and makes it easier to spin because when it's like this, it's all kind of stuck together and this would be very hard to spin. Whereas you can see now that I've combed it, it's, kind of, it's all fluffy and it'll be much easier to spin and produce a more consistent yarn. So you comb it out until you've got it to the kind of the consistency you want and you've got the knots out of it and you, there might be a little bit of debris you could pick out and then you what you have here is called rolling, r roving or a roll ag. It is what yarn is before it becomes yarn. So people use this to spin. They use it for, and they use it for needle felting and, and other kinds of uh, felting projects, wet felting projects. So once you've got it in this uh, condition, you're ready to put it on a spinning wheel and spin. So I've got my wheel here. And this is called an upright wheel. A lot of people are used to seeing the Saxon style wheels, but it does the same thing. And people like to watch the wheel going round and round, but where the real action is happening is between my hands. So if you watch, my right hand is holding the twist back, and when I let go with my right hand, you'll see the twist go up into the wool. So spinning, what I always tell people, is just a matter of controlling the twist. So when, before the wool is spun into, into yarn, you know, you can just pull it apart real easily. But once it's twisted, it gives it strength. It's that twist that gives it strength and keeps it from falling apart. Now, I'm spinning a fairly thin yarn here. And if I wanted to make a thicker yarn, I could either just spin it thicker by not pulling the, the 
roving so thin, so you can see that makes it thicker right there, or I could ply the yarn, which means I take two singles, like what I just spun, and, I'm just, and wind them together so that they wind up on each other and make applied yarn like that. Now that was just a quick and dirty demonstration of how to ply. If I was plying for real, I would use the two bobbins down here and run it through the wheel. It's pretty much just like the spinning, but you, when you ply the yarn, when you spin the yarn, you have the wheel going in one direction. I do it clockwise when I spin. And then when you ply the yarn, you spin the wheel in the opposite direction, and that's what locks in that twist.